it's a page. Yeah, you can, you know, it's all over. With the audio, with with the audio it's sound. Sound. It's really cool. So check that out. It's like, oh, it's B-P-N-X-Y. They're on the 10th floor. And uh, so yeah, the fate of music outs is just code See that? That's that's when you know someone knows this. All right. So we have people joining with the live stream on Google Air. A lot of people haven't heard of Google Air before, but since this is a content uh, lecture series or talk, this lecture is kind of too formal. Is uh, that is another way to distribute your content. So a lot of people might have heard of Google Hangouts. But if you actually type in search Google on air, you'll see a uh, ability to present a live stream of your talk or your blog or your video cast. People can join you. You can have discussions with viewers. And it's recording it on YouTube. So once it's done, you get everything packaged up as well. So we're doing Penske for the slides. We're doing the live and the recording there. And then just for the sake of backup, what we always do when you're starting to get into everything, I really strongly advise always recording your content, which we're doing here as well. And what ends up happening is, as much as you think it may not matter, or someone may say it doesn't matter, we end up using the content that we record over and over and over. It's kind of like whether or not you like repeating yourself. <laughs> if anyone ever says, hey, how'd that go? And you really don't want to tell them again, that moment is when you knew that you should have recorded it, you should have wrote it down. Because if you say it twice, it's really your fault, not theirs. So, um, and not only that, but it's unique content that you're getting up to. So I'm not going to do too much lecturing. I was just settling in, getting us acclimated here. So to start it off, um, this is Nuco SF. Thanks for joining. Um, we did one yesterday, so hopefully we worked out some of the kinks so that you guys could have a, a good time. Um, we just did the introduction to the space, the social snack times and drinks. Hopefully, people got drunk enough to think that I'm doing a good job. Because <laughs> um, you know, when they don't, then you're much more critical. Uh, but uh, thank you for the last two. Keep them coming. It makes me feel like everything's going well, even if it's not. And um, so Twitter is my handle, S. Shadman. Um, if you want to say something good, if you want to say something bad, obviously, the internet doesn't work. Uh, at share this. Uh, is the company that I work for. It's good to let them know you're here. So we keep doing this every year, which I really like doing. And hashtag Nuco, which is what we're doing here. So all in all, you have probably seven extra characters on Twitter to, to say something else. And then um, share this. Like I said about repeating yourself, if you go to sharethis.com slash rocketship, we have open codes presentation I did last year on that page, along with a bunch of other presentations we did, did uh, for things like MySQL and data mining. And we take all those things, we created a rocket ship page so that anyone ever says, hey, I'd like to work for you guys, go to the rocket ship. You'll see what we do, how we do it. If anyone here is interested in the depth of what we do, the old open code, we talk about it, as well as all the other things we do is share, share this or there. So sharethis.com slash rocket ship so no one has to say anything twice, and you'll have it forever. And then uh, lastly, uh, seanchapman.com is where I put up other musings of mine. That, um, that sometimes suck and sometimes are good. I don't want to make it sound like it's great, but you know, I put up stuff sometimes that are interesting. I think sometimes. Uh, uh, <laughs> I never really want to say that. Self promotion always really sucks. All right, so uh, that's it. And this is me. Uh, so I'm Sean Shadman. Uh, I am an entrepreneur, like a lot of you. I heard, heard a couple people talking about something they're starting. I heard someone from Amsterdam's coming. I think one really thing cool about Open Code, which is now called Nuco. Uh, is that we end up getting people from all over the world, who, or all over the nation at least, who's not from the Bay Area? Raise your hand. That's pretty, that's like 50%. Who's not from California? Or, is, you know, like, look at you. Right, okay, so this is the Amsterdam guy. Sorry to call you out. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I'm an entrepreneur like many of you in this audience or that will be viewing this later. Um, I began my first real startup. I've been doing startups since I was probably... 13 or 14, going and knocking on people's door and asking them to buy stuff. Um, but most recently, in the last eight years, I started creating a few startups. Um, first one being in DC, where I come from, and then moving one out here to San Francisco, going back to DC, starting another one, coming out here and starting my most recent one, which got acquired last year, March 2013, by this company, Share This, which is where we currently reside, and uh, who's hosting this event and paying for the food and everything like that. So thank you for that. Uh, to them, and uh, you probably have seen us before. 
uh, where the widget, the share buttons that you see, um, the share icon that you see that says, hey, click me, so that you can say what you need to say about this page, this piece of content, uh, to Twitter or Facebook or Pinterest. We actually power 2.4 million publishers with this tool, and we push it over 120 social channels. Um, more and more, the number of social channels is a diminishing thing as social has gone from something that is who's going to be the one to probably four or five where every year one extra person comes out that blows us away or one two. Um, so that amount is shrinking, but the amount is still large when you look at the global scale. Like different countries use different things uh, specifically to share a content like Orku, for instance, is a bigger one I think in India. So uh, it's still important to have a lot of channels on a global scale. Um, as most people know, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Pinterest, uh, WhatsApp now uh, is really the main ones in our great country. 85% um, of online audience uh, goes through our stuff, so we see a whole lot of products. Usually, I would say turn off your phones, but I'm not because what we did originally, um, the company that I acquired is a mobile company, so I'm a mobile guy. And if you can't use your phone, then it's kind of hypocritical of me. So do whatever you want with your phone. <laughs> that's, the age we, that's the age we live in, and I am totally okay with that. Uh, if, you don't, if I'm not interesting enough to hear it, that's my fault, not yours. But um, we live in that world, and that's okay. One other thing that we get to do, because we see so many share this, uh, so many buttons through our tools, and so much usage of those buttons, and so many implementations, and so many sites, we're able to aggregate that data in interesting ways. For instance, For the Win at USA Today uses our API to find out what thing is being shared the most. A lot of times, people will put up things that are clicked the most. Um, a lot of times, people put up things that are viewed the most. We really focus on the social factor. What we really strongly believe, and we've shown in the data, is that if someone shares a lot about cars, they or someone they know is really interested in cars. So although it's not specifically intent-based data, which Google, for instance, does. I search for Toyota. I have the intent to do something with Toyota. Uh, we specifically look at social, which is more interest, and interest is also an indicator. We use that in information to uh, uh, target uh, users. So for instance, a lot of things that differentiate us, and one of those things is that uh, when someone wants to target one of our users through our ad products, we don't sell our data. So other companies, for instance, and, and like I said, one of our differentiators is every time someone uses us, we put it in a black box, and only we can touch it. We work directly with businesses, so we're a B2B company um, on the ad side, where they'll say, I want to find people who love cars, and we'll say, we'll find them for you. We make the financial exchange, but we don't make the user exchange. So publishers that work with us don't ever have to wonder, is their usernames, is their emails, is their identifiers given to agencies, and then to the rest of the world. Uh, other companies make a lot of money doing that, but that's an immutable thing that we've decided is really important to us, um, and so we keep strong to that. Uh, another thing is that we see about 12 billion requests a day, so, um, and that's growing. This is from last year's slide. So 12 billion requests a day allows us to see a whole lot of information, and we have a nice data science team with really smart people with three letters at the end of their name, PhD, that tell us um, what it all means when we have questions. We have this really cool tool that we're building in-house called Barbara. So you can ask Barbara a question and say, hey, Barb, uh, what is the most shared thing in the morning across these types of sites with this type of uh, content? And it'll be like, yeah, your answer is it doesn't actually talk. But, um, <laughs> but uh, even if it did, like Syria wouldn't really do that good of a job. So really, it just gives you the data back. And again, that is rocket ship, uh, where you can learn more about that information. But I'm not going to do a whole thing on self-promotion. Uh, as I told some of you, we're going to actually take um, an interesting route here, so just bear with me. Um, so last time uh, at OpenCo, uh, which is what I called last year, we talked a lot about the house. We talked about how we work, how we innovate, how we support growth in San Francisco, and a really important thing that happened last year and happened sometimes on Facebook is I'm not saying any other city any other place in the world is worse or better. That's not what I'm saying, so don't get mad with this statement. But San Francisco is amazing because what we do that is really great is that we talk about business and startups like fine wine. It's not probably a coincidence that we're next to Napa where a lot of wine is made. We really get down with it. Lots of times when I have ideas um, with other groups of friends from other parts of the world, I'll say, hey, what do you think of this? And they're like, that's stupid. It won't make any money. Or what are you thinking? And that's the end of that conversation. Here, what I really love, and when I first moved here about eight, uh, seven, eight years ago, is that I'd sit, to, sit down with people at a poker game, at Dropbox or Facebook. We're all in the same place. We all have the same mission. 
um, as opposed to going from PC with a lot of lawyers, for instance. Again, nothing wrong with them, just saying there's a difference. Uh, I sit down at a, at a regular poker game, and we'll be like, you know, it'd be cool. What if a picture did this, this, and this? And someone's like, that's really cool. What if? Da 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 da. And those conversations seem to happen a lot more, specifically in the software, web, tech, media space. Um, and I really love that. I think that's what makes this area really super great. Um, last time we also talked about technology, all the technologies that we use in the company. Uh, again, this is something that's on that rocket ship page, uh, but we have a lot of supporters, which is really nice about this city. A lot of things are actually built in this city or in the Bay Area. And as you saw, we walked by something that we used in this office, like uh, Nginx. So um, what's really nice about that is you just know that what you're using has the ability to be contacted with someone where I can go to a meetup and actually meet the guy or girl that built that thing. Um, and there's something really interesting about that that creates that ambience that a lot of people try to bottle up. We also talked last year, most importantly, about our interactions in content. So the way content and the way we interact with that content has changed a lot. Most recently, in the last 30 years, we've gone from, I'm going to go sit down at a computer, and I'm going to intent-based search, or I want to go to a place, and I'll get on a plane, or I want to see a show, what's on TV. We went from those types of things only 30 years ago. And as we moved into different mediums and different products, we still went to sit by the computer, but we started talking about a stream of consciousness, which is very different than a published, curated thing that takes a while to distribute to people. We went to a, uh, in a point where I'm interested in thinking about something maybe someone wants to know. We're not talking about whether they should know. We're talking about whether they want to know and whether I want to say it. And after that, we got to a point where we had mobile devices. And as everyone, know now, everyone knows now, uh, the mobile device take that stream of con consciousness to another level, which was everywhere I am at any moment, I can just say what's on my mind. Uh, we dabbled in that last time. Um, 150 uh, times people check the phone per day is another thing that we talked about. That's really interesting. Um, again, stream of consciousness. We just dipped our toe in it. Today we're going to go deeper in what that means as part of the talk. Um, we also looked at how all that consciousness affected the Internet Minute, how many shares and posts go up. Um, in 2015, they said it would take five years if you watched all the videos back to back on YouTube. Um, six million Facebook views uh, and logins and search for, and all these different things that are happening in one minute, right? That was really interesting. Um, and if you want to go deeper in this again, this will be online for you to see. And then finally, last time we talked about the future. And at the end, we took the last few minutes to get a little bit more abstract and say, well, what does it mean if we have all this data going online? What, what does it look like from a product standpoint, from a how standpoint? What are the things we need to build? How are we going to manage that? How are we going to manage bandwidth? And I think you guys might have heard, who's heard about the fiber optic cable that's being linked through the Atlantic? Yeah, so Google's working on making that connection. Everyone's working on making that connection. And what does that look like? And the big question uh, for this, we're going to take a, a, a different approach, like I said, and we're going to just start asking questions, kind of the fine wine thing. What I wanted to do with this talk as opposed to last year is instead of talk about what we did in San Francisco, I'm going to do a thought experiment with you guys, and I'm going to ask the question, what is content? And I'm going to keep diving into that. So uh, does anyone want to guess, take a, take a stab at what content is? I didn't think so. Not, not everyone had enough drinks yet. That's what I was talking about. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> we'll get to it. All right. So, uh, so what is content? As we have access to more and more content in our daily lives, the question that becomes more and more important to viewers, oops, yeah, for the most part, we know it when we see it. Uh, for the most part, we know when we see it, it's a substance or material we deal with in speech, images, tweets, or memes. It's substance, it's material that we deal with. It looks a lot like this, which is, some people would say, that's good content. I can sink my teeth into that. And other times, it looks like this. <laughs> <laughs> I love this stuff. As we have access to more and more content in our daily lives, the question that becomes more and more important to viewers is whether this content is worse or better than the previous one. Many will say it, the latter, like this one, is awful. And we read content like this in droves every day. Why? So maybe the question isn't, what is content? Which is, I know it is, but we're not quick to answer when someone asks. To, what is good content? 
Does anyone know right off the bat what good content is? Oh. I think that's a really good answer. Yeah. I think that's one way to say anyone else wanted to get that. Yeah. I just wanted to dispute a little bit that too. You know, I mean, it's just as important to know what negative thoughts are out there as there is positive thoughts. And that's very actionable information that the company, you know, will work to and, and react to. So I'm a little bit, you know, nervous about good and bad content. Well, I love it. You're going to love this stuff. <laughs> That's actually, no, no joke, that is actually a great two points. And I think it could have been better uh, better said. Can I have my hundred? Yeah, actually, we're going to get to a lot more things. So it's just warming you up, but I love it. I mean, I really, really think what you guys said, it means we're all going to be a good company. This is going to be a, a, a cool talk, I can tell already. So thanks for, thanks for saying something. Um, so fair warning, this discussion is going to get philosophical. We'll keep diving deeper and deeper into the questions like that around content. Neither of you guys are wrong. We're just keep asking that question and figuring more out. I know we all love presentation structures that involve action items, best practices, and checklists so that when we leave, we're like, no, oh, I know what to do. We'll leave. But we're not going to do that today. Sometimes, though, it's important to take a step back and just ask and have the ability to answer, based on those questions, deeper, more relevant, harder questions that have two sides of the story. Um, it, after all, good and bad is actually one of the greatest, oldest philosophical questions because it's not a one person has an answer to that problem. It's good or bad. I mean, good is very uh, subjective. So is it even the right question to ask at all, like you said? Is it even the right question to say, is it good or bad? I don't know. But if some of you guys are yawning during that part, we're going to have a little bit of fun too, so we're going to hopefully get everyone interested. Uh, throughout the talk, we'll have questions like we did there. We're going to work on the honor code. If you answer a question, and you're not just raising your hand and just answering the question to get something, uh, just walk up at the end of it, take something from our swag. It all has branding on it, but it's free, and that's, again, the trade-off that you have to make. Um, a lot of space and drab, free stuff with logos. But some of the stuff is pretty cool, so if you answer, answer a question, a really thoughtful question, I'll let you be the judge whether you did that or not. It's not up to me to decide whether it's good or bad. Uh, go up there and take something at the end. So let's really get started. So that's right. So let's get dirty. Our philosophical journey will start with resurrecting a very old question. If a tree falls in a forest and no one is here to see it, does it make a sound? Raise your hand if you've heard that before. This doesn't count as a question. <laughs> <laughs> Raise your hands when it doesn't count. Everyone. That's a really common question. Um, you may be quick to answer, of course it makes a sound. I've heard a tree fall, and I heard the sound. My presence is not required. And that person usually pops up inside and wants to prove that that's a stupid question. But again, we're doing thought experiments today. So the question is more of that than anything else. What makes the question interesting isn't the science of sound, which is interesting in and of itself, but it's the philosophy behind the observation and the reality of what sound is with an observer. That's much more interesting. Thought experiments like that uncover new questions that may live beneath the surface that are able to be more directly answered, answering more monumental questions. So let's use our time together to dive into a thought experiment around content and see where we end up. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like the same guy, too, doesn't it? It took a while to find those two. <laughs> Hope you appreciate it. All right, so, uh, so let's do it. Let's ask that thought experiment question to start off. And it's going to be a few questions that might change along the way. If information is created, but it's never shared for others to see it, is it still content? Don't be that nerd. Let that question sink in, right? Uh, is it still content if no one's shared? I mean, if content can stand on its own without communication, would you say that all the hundreds of thousands of ideas in all our heads are locked in, the, in our minds, and all of them are pieces of content? I mean, we're having one right now. Are we having millions of moments of content? I don't know. Maybe that could be what it is. Or maybe content is so inextricably tied to sharing that the two can't maintain the definition on their own. Okay? If that's the case, then what side is more important to determine goodness? How well is it distributed? Or how well is it formed and presented? Again, just more questions. Uh, so on one hand, we can determine how good or bad content is if no one is able to see it. So this is content. How good and bad is this? I don't 
oh, no, I can't see it, so therefore it's not content. And on the other hand, is it worthwhile if content every is something that everyone sees, but it means nothing? I don't know. I don't know a lot of things. <laughs> content is more than text, sound, or an image in and of itself. Does anyone know this period? This counts. What this is? I want a, a mass Four minute question, yeah. Mass nice So, very good. Content is more than text, sound, or an image in and of itself. In its most basic form, it's a projection of our thoughts that we thrust out into the world. As Maslow would probably put it, it's a basic human need that makes us social and it allows us to self-actualize. Content is that. I'm not saying that's the only thing it is, but it is that. If, who's this guy? It's a tough one. Looks like one. Oh, nice. Who said that? Nice one. Descartes. If Descartes was alive today, he's a philosopher. Uh, if Descartes was alive today, he may devise a whole new cogito. Does anyone know what a cogito is? I think, therefore, I am. Everyone knows that, right? Yeah. So he wrote the thing different. So if he was alive today, which he isn't, as you can see by his haircut, well, depends on where you're from. If, if Descartes was alive today, he may devise a whole new cogito from I think, therefore, I am to I share, therefore, I am. I know that looks a little corny, but it gets the point across. We've always, we always hear that there are no good or bad questions, right? We always hear that in schools we brought up, and hopefully in your companies. And we, all are, we are all unique, and all our thoughts are important reflections of ourselves. And if you don't believe that, it'll take a few thousand dollars in therapy to get to that point. But we're all good people. We all have thoughts, and we all have good thoughts, and they're all good things. So why are we so driven to deem content good or bad at all? If it's fundamentally just a projection of ourselves. I mean, that means that you saying, you, like saying that Donald Trump specifically is a bad person, and yeah, you could have that debate, but he's existence. He lives today. Yeah. Going back to that period, uh, that pyramid, and the fact that we distribute content on our own to self actually to display something about yourself, passing judgment on content is it's good itself in yeah, content. Yeah, totally. And then like, what's going to happen during this presentation, I think that's a really good point, is that there's definitely a lot of like self reflexive, like, uh, or are we doing something right now as we're doing that thing? But for this thought experiment, we're just going to keep diving and asking those questions, whether it's right or wrong to do so, just to get to that, that conclusion. But you're 100% right. They're, they're, as I was writing this, I was thinking, well, shit, kind of doing the thing. And, but it's like, uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, it's like uh, Back to the Future, Austin Powers, where they're doing the time machine. He goes, but if you went back and you're here now, he goes, just don't think about it. It'll work better for the movie. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know if you guys saw that, but. So, where were we? So, so, I think therefore I am becomes I share therefore I am. We always hear there are no good or bad questions. And we're all, oh, I already did that. Why is content? Sorry. <laughs> Why is content? And I know this isn't a form, a well formed sentence. It could be considered bad content of itself. Um, but why is content is what we're going at here. We're just deconstructing content more and more and thinking why is content, why does it exist, why do I read it, why do I like it, why should I, you know, like all those types of whys. Why is content? So we from what is content, what is good content, why is content, and I'm going to list off some things I was thinking of. Uh, so content is the transferring of our minds and being to an everlasting form. It gives us eternal life and has so for thousands of years. One of the most advanced technologies, if you think of it that way, that's ever been created in the world. It's more powerful than a time, uh, time well, not a time machine, but a, a cryogenic freezer. Like This is really powerful stuff with not a lot of other things required. There's no electricity required, no, no uh, freezing process or anything like that. This is what it is. It's eternal life. Our short, finite lives are made infinite. Does anyone know what this is? <laughs> what is YOLO? You only live once. You only live once, right. So it's an acronym, but it eloquently states from a very important thing. You only live once. But with the entire world filled with these projected minds that we've kind of been working through, we are projecting our minds out there. With the world full of these minds in the form of content, we have the ability to live vicariously through other people. We can choose how to dive into your life. I can go to your Facebook page and say, Ooh, I want to live like you for two minutes, and that sucks. And I'm going to go live on someone else <laughs> for a little while. Uh, I'm into cats today. I'm into babies today. You get to do that. I don't have a kid, but I feel like I have a kid. 
Uh, and I have no expenses for it, and that's awesome. And I get to do that over and over, and I can choose the better looking kids than the others too. So if those concepts, <laughs> so if those concepts are too abstract for your fancy, and some people like going that way, some people don't. When I talk to my dad sometimes about these things, we try to. Usually he just goes, uh, I don't really care. So if those concepts are too abstract for your fancy, and that goes back to why I'm in therapy school. Yeah. So if those concepts are too abstract. <laughs> Those concepts are too attractive for your fancy, and you're more of the practical type, then let's frame it this way. Content gets stuff done more quickly. That's, that's a fact. It does. It's maybe not be the only way, but it does. The faster we communicate, the faster we can act between us. Right? I, I give you information locked in my head. You give me information locked in your head. And just like DNA, all our contributions result in a greater overall result that may have taken ages that we attempted to think do it on our own. So let's kind of try a thesis here. So what is it that I present is this. The figuring out how to label content as good or bad comes from an entirely wrong place. The real question should be, and I say should be as a presenter, again, should is just because I get to do that, but it's not should, should, right? So for this presentation, the real question should be, how do we use this content or that content? Where can we put each bit of content to allow our thoughts a chance to live in the open so that anyone can get the value they choose? Content is simply a medium we use at the moment we have thoughts to overcome our inability to be able to be inside someone else's head. The real endeavor is to cut out the middleman completely and just exchange thoughts. Does anyone know what first principles are? Does anyone want to try to talk about that? First principles, you might have heard people say that in the product world or in the technology or science world. First principles kind of is the idea that like, um, uh, I'm sitting here and I want to get this ball into that hole. So making a club to get it there isn't first principles, it's golf. Right? First principles is taking the ball and putting it in the hole. Right? The objective is to get the ball in the hole. You put a bunch of stuff in the middle to get it done, to be fun and all those things. But first principle is ball and hole. You don't need a car to get somewhere. Sometimes you say, get me over there 100 miles away, we think car. Yeah, that might be the most efficient, but the first principle is, I want to be there, not I want a car. A lot of times when you create products and you try to build a car, you're missing the point completely. So back to the uh, presentation, is to cut out the middleman completely and just exchange thoughts. You go to the first principle, is it's the exchange of thoughts. And until we can do that, our goal is to shorten the time it takes to transfer our emotions, ideas, and our lives as much as possible. Ultimate efficiency, eternal life. Some people might hate that, I can hear it. Ultimate efficiency, eternal life, and dare I say, maybe even peace, will be achieved in that final moment. It won't be about us dealing with good and bad content. It will be about us accepting all thoughts as a chance to achieve those ultimate goals. So this is the other thing that comes back. Really, dude? Uh, this is getting a little, yeah, really. If you appreciate the reality that a single mind is the ultimate goal, then it'll give you clues to foresee what products or content society will face next. It might be wrong, it might be right, but we're in San Francisco, we get to have ideas, and the idea is if that's true, what clues does it give us? Does it constitute a first principle that we can build something from scratch from? I'm not saying we'll achieve singularity tomorrow, nor am I here to rally everyone to start making changes so that we do so, and that's because it's inevitable. I'm here to help add to a map on how and why content exists so we can navigate what comes our way. Add to it, I'm not defining it, but I'm adding to that map or creating useful products along the way. The real problem, the first principle, the real problem we are attempting to solve all these years around content in almost all products we make, and I use the word almost to get out of the fact that if I'm wrong, almost all products, is how do we decrease the inefficiency impeding us from that singularity? And by the way, there's a, does anyone know what singularity is? Anyone have there's, a, there's a lot of ways to interpret it. Does anyone Kurzweil, try? You're talking about yeah, the very first world singularity. Nailed it. Yeah. Definitely get a prize for that. Um, he made it really popular. Uh, there's a lot of, I'm really taking singularity in a very high level approach. I'm saying singularity in the sense of. Um, when, we, um, yeah, when we merge with machines, that technology. It's, it's increasing at an exponential curve, and pretty soon our you know, biological brains won't be able to keep up with how fast technology is increasing, so we're going to have to merge with the AI, the technology, all that stuff to be able to keep up. That's exactly right. That's 
So we'll get, uh, technology is moving so fast that at some point it will exceed biology, right? AI will take over. So that's the base definition. What I'm using here is a little bit more definition, Webster's definition type, where it's just the oneness, right? That might be the way we do it. It may be biological, maybe technolog technological, it may be because we become cyborgs. Kurzweil specifically thinks it'll happen in the next 40 years. Some people would disagree, but he's been writing a lot about things. He's actually now the director of Google Engineering, so they didn't think he was that crazy, or they thought he was crazy enough to hire. And um, <laughs> and really, uh, I'm using it in that way. Like whatever it is, remember this is a why conversation. So whatever it ends up being, the why is a little bit more easy for us to look at with this talk because we're just saying if something like that happens, that singular moment, why? What what does it look like? And with that singularity, each new product attempts, think of that by the way, each new product attempts to close that time gap from one person's mind to another. One other part of that is if everything's a machine, there's some single source or some cloud of information you all have access to. So it's pretty much instant information. Has anyone seen um, Her? Yeah? Okay, wow. Uh, Her, at the very end, they're like, I'm actually having 150 relationships right now. That's kind of like a singularity, right? Except it was his girlfriend. Still not. <laughs> Not him, but left behind. Still not convinced that time is the ultimate direction. Some may, some may not. But again, just to dive a little deeper, let's take a break from the abstract and go into history. In the beginning, it was a lack of the written word, passing down information through story. I got the job done, but it could take a lifetime or more for anyone to have a chance to see one's work or hear one's thoughts in order to make use of them. It was super lossy. Does anyone know what lossy means? Lossy is like a pic picture, like a really nice high-def picture. I save it, and it becomes a low-def picture. I lost data. Storytelling is very lossy. I say, hey, let's go to the bank tomorrow. It's Bank of America. Follow the red sign. The next person, like, came a telephone says, hey, let's go to the bank somewhere. He's <laughs> lost data. So conversation well, information is lossy, and writing written word is not. So what happened after that is someone was like, I need this story to be told the exact same way over and over. Yes, there may be different interpretations, which we won't get into in this talk. You can really well, so don't ask. But no, I'm just kidding. You can ask. But I won't answer. So the written word helped set those words in stone, literally, so that although interpretation was still at play, the base from which we worked was identical. So those could read the original. Unfortunately, you had to be able to read or have someone be able to read to you. And then, boom, the creation of the printing press came along. Anyone with an idea could have a shot at distributing many, many of their thoughts in one's lifetime. So now we're in one's lifetime. I'm getting my ideas out right away. Rich or poor, academically educated or not, as long as you can read or have someone read to you. Does anyone know who this is? Luther. Yeah, that's right. So an example of how powerful an easily copied piece of text could be is seen in the 1500s when the Christian world perception of their religion was altered because of a German friar named Martin Luther, and the content he shared was very powerful. Do you want to take a guess on how long it took to circulate this information? Two years before it got circulated. Two years. So now we went from a lifetime to two years. Can you imagine having to wait two years to have your information exchanged? In all the things at play and the way that we work, um, just to read the original. And unfortunately, there was only one original. Uh, so while it, so, I'm sorry. So, sorry. Can you imagine waiting two years for the question? Are ideas to be circulated? How fresh, just forget that, I'll cut it out. How frustrating for us to imagine at the time, not only did communication work on a schedule like that, but the perception was that not everyone needed to read or share content in the first place because the common folk were too dumb. Everyone's kind of learned that in school. It's like, why do we need to print a billion of these or a million of these things? No one knows how to use it, it's not for them. What could they bring to the table? We look back then and like, oh, that's so gross. It's a travesty around the freedom of information. But is our generation all that different? When we created AppMaker, one of the startups uh, I created with uh, some co-founders, uh, the same objections came up. AppMaker was a thing that allowed anyone in 2010 to make a fully native application through web interface. And we got a lot of pushback from investors or people was that originally was that you might make four. Uh, no one wants to make an app. I'm not going to make an app for me. I'm not going to make an app for my small business. It's for big companies. And we were actually a consulting company before that. And we were doing 100,000 odd deals just to make an app. And we were like, no, it just isn't right. Everyone should have access to it. So even four years ago, believe it or not, people said you'd make four apps. That day that we released AppMaker, we were the first to do it. We made, we had requests for thousands of apps. And it just keeps going to that point. And it happens over and over. That was our guiding principle then. And it is still now. Content is for everyone. 
It, it's not whether it's good or bad, you need to give access to people. We've seen the drive to democratize content and the speed and its ability to distribute them for hundreds of years in the printing press at the beginning and the keeps on going. So getting our thoughts out into the world in years to weeks to seconds, and still the problem remains here, even with seconds, that not everyone had access. This is something for the privilege and something only the privilege should give. Why should you have a way to give your content? You don't know how to curate it. You don't know what good content is. Again, this happened not that long ago. You don't know what good content is, or that isn't good content, or you can't write good content. We want to move. And hopefully everyone recognizes this, you get to the point where they don't, but this is the modem. And uh, in the modem, uh, the internet was born. Instant transfer of anyone's thoughts, anyone willing to access it was also there, and it was given the perfect term, getting connected. I don't think it could have been an accident, but uh, I think it's really apropos. Our path kept continuing in that place. So looking back at that pyramid that we only touched on last year, we went from Wi-Fi and PCs to laptops, from laptops to phone. We keep decreasing the time it takes for each of your thoughts to get out there. The iPhone was also thought of as a bad by critics. Remember, and when the iPhone came out, everyone with a Blackberry was like, what's the point of this? It's a piece of crap. It's, it's not good. So uh, my girlfriend came to me yesterday. She goes, you have a potty mouth. You need to stop saying that. So uh, it wasn't good. Many missed. The big achievement. We had a lot of companies come to us that year because we were building a mobile company. They're like, what made iPhone work? And Nokia and all these other companies came and asked us, why is iPhone doing well? And it was always the same principle that people don't get. It's not about what to get good things up. And I know Apple had a, a regulation on what you're allowed to push. It's a different type of good, but um, Google doesn't. Um, they're doing well. Uh, it's not about the good or the bad. It's the, bad. it's the fact that it gave everyone this one button, easy access. You have something to say. You have something to read. Do it right now. Nothing's going to get in the way as much as possible. So the credit card's taken care of at the store. It is, you are on. You can download that. Although it had imperfections then that's been approved since then, um, that was amazing. It's that that made it powerful. So here's another thought. Whether it's a lifetime to years, or whether it's three seconds to one second, if you can decrease the time it takes to get anyone's mind into the open, you are on something. Anyone's mind. And of course, we always hear the call to arms and everyone's so different now, and bad, and chaotic. We are so much worse and impatient than the people of the past, and I offer a different perspective. Things are only different in the tools we use, but our yearning and desires are exactly the same, just like it was then. Hear me. Or, as this person reads the newspaper to workers, may I please have access to what's going on out there? Our heads are no more immersed in the desire today than it has been for generations before us. We're just able to achieve those goals more practically. Data has always been thrust upon us. We're simply trying to make it all more manageable from one person to the next. What we're trying to drive towards is the moment where my thoughts are yours in the same moment. The thinking of the frustration you've ever felt when you just wanted someone to understand what you were saying and all you were left with was words and gestures and depending on what country you're from and, and maybe a whiteboard like that to get the point across. How awfully inefficient that is. Just get in my head for a second so we can move on. The channels we've seen are just manifestations of that desire that we have. It's still far away, but that is the direction we're headed and have been headed since the word I. Anything that shortens that gap for anyone to get anything to anyone else is following that trajectory and delivering goodness. Is it asking too much? Are we really so much more impatient in the past? Why is a month too long, but a minute is just right? A minute's, minute's the right time for us to be patient. What is it compared to? Cutting the time in half and cutting the time in half again from 3 seconds to 1.5 seconds to 7.75? What is it compared to? Cutting that time in half is cutting that time in half. Every generation cuts that time in half. And it always will be twice as long when you look back. That's it. It's relative. It's always twice as long before. It's going to be half as much before. It. It's a minute. It's a second. It's a millisecond. It's time. All content that is caged is bad content. All content is case maybe is bad content because it doesn't have the chance to allow someone to try and make it their mark, to live vicariously through shared story or help them self-actualize. 
Sure, with this digital tool, there's great power, there's fear some people have when we talk about moments of singularity. Um, and how can we all handle it? There's a lot of information. Uh, content is a tool to convey our thoughts. We have all kinds of them. They seem like garbage or gold from one person to the next. There's a difference between a dagger or the same knife that is cutting, uh, is cutting uh, a tomato. It's the exact same tool. It's just like saying this is a knife or this is a knife. And there are tons of other knives out there with different balances and edges and different shapes. They're all just channels for us to express ourselves with one another more quickly. Not less, but more quickly, and that could take any form. We connect in less time by decreasing the physical distance between us. So I'm trying to reframe, you guys are looking at this, not so much the second principle of creating a golf club, it's the first principle. We're just decreasing time by physical distance in our technology, and that's what was so different when people were naysayers about whether a mobile device would make that much of it. It's the same tool, different purpose. So, oops. so this is the pocket, this is the bed, this is another way that we make the time between our interactions more quick, quickly. We connect with less clicks and less ge gestures. And yes, sometimes that stream of consciousness means we trade a <laughs> breadth of connection and sometimes something trivial and seemingly painful to read. See this is a really classic, yeah. why do I want to know who's eating waffles because Twitter sucks. Like, I hear that once a week, or maybe once a month, or something. I don't want to hear about your waffles. It's like, that's, yeah, I mean, like, it's in my head, and it's out there. It really doesn't make that much of a difference. It's just that barrier. Or the same thing, to your point earlier, which I love so much, is the accuracy of depth, the critical information that is otherwise caged. Nevertheless, in both instances, we are connecting more effectively. Believe me, when we do end up truly connecting our thoughts, it'll be scarier and far more noisier than today. But innovators like you, We'll be propelled to figure out how to appreciate that and allow for that connection to build from, not work on tearing them down. And each passing generation will have a higher bandwidth that can handle the last. This will be twice as long. So maybe it's not about whether the connection is good or bad. Heck, maybe it's not even about how much it gets shared. Maybe it's always purely been about how many people are connected and how quickly they can achieve that connection. Content and sharing are those two fundamental ways that we're able to do it today. They are the means to the end. They are our rocks and our knives and our arrows for lack of any other means. But they themselves are not the goal. So many good content could be defined as anything that connects anyone in less time or complexity than what is currently out there. From stones to books, magazines and newspapers to TVs to websites and blogs. One communication distribution became instant, like this, getting it on the internet. Then we started moving on towards to the time gap between exchanging information we talked in the beginning, where we just say, what's your status? Thoughts and emotions and ideas were created and deployed more quickly and frequently with statuses that are 104 letter characters max. A real stream of consciousness was reward. And that consciousness was further fed with the ability to post even when we are next to a computer. So hopefully, we're starting to see these things as just not posts that are good or bad, but this is someone's mind that I'm looking at. So let's take a step back to today. Everyone here at one point, even me, laughed at this app at first. And I bet the person who made it laughed, so I don't think there's a problem. But why did it work? Are we to judge how short this content is? Does anyone know what this is? Everyone, like, raise your hand if you don't know. Or explain what this is, someone. <laughs> it's, it's an app that basically you sign up and you just send a yo. All you can do to only talk to them is floater and all these send me go. Yeah, that's right. So you open it, you open it, you find a person, this is exactly what happens. You open it, you find the person, you press it, it sends them an instant message that says yeah. So the idea there is that all you can do is yeah. And it decreases the amount of time for that interaction. So the end goal is about getting a feeling or thought or emotion to whatever you want or as many people as you want. This got invested a million dollars recently because it actually ended up having five million users in the first month. And we're like, wow, let's tear it down. But why are we doing that? We don't do that here. Let's not do it while we're doing this new code thing. Why is it so surprising? Less characters and quick, intuitive interface has created a quicker connection between people. In first principles, we are searching for the depth and substance, but we really should just be talking about the mind meld moment. Because what I'm doing here is I'm saying, yo, I'm thinking of you. Funny, but true. Or yo, I'm in town. If the message is received and the minds are linked, then it is content, and it is valuable, and it is good. 
yes, there's beauty in the creation process, and that shouldn't be forgotten. But let's also recognize that the process was originally created to convey the idea with the tools available at the time. Losing sight of this is just, just as destructive as the other. The art comes from the need, and some of our need is satisfied by the art, which could be why memes are so powerful, quick and efficient. Creatively assembled, instant connection, complex and otherwise tough to describe moment. You know this guy, you know his backstory, you know the schema, here's the joke on top of it, done, move to the next one. Uh, you get it. My mind was melted for you for that moment. And then we take that even further and we look at Vine as a five second video clip. And if you're afraid to share because you, you don't want that information to get out there, you have Snapchat. Then you post, five seconds later, the information's gone, decreasing the barrier to want to send it. And then you look at the quantified self. We want to be so much closer that we actually invented tools and, pro and products that connect to our bodies. The quantified self tells me when my heart's beating. What's really interesting and amazing about this is I've been talking this whole thing about the mind melt and the consciousness, but really we've got to a point where my body is talking and skips right over the consciousness altogether. We went even faster. We've connected our bodies to our minds even before our mind even knows what's happening. And that's the quantified self. It gives us access. It gives freedom to our bodies and our bodies. So, and with this, for the thought experiment, yield this for me. We'll have a Q&A, so I went a little over, uh, but uh, this is what I yielded. Good content is anything that connects anyone, anyone's thought effectively in less time with less complexity than is currently out there. Could be long, it could be short, but it's about getting my mind into someone else. So what I ask is that as you leave today and you see a Yo app, you see a picture app that does something and you're like, oh, yuck, think and step back and say, what did it do? Did I get that emotion? Maybe I should create something as I'm working on my product that gets that mind milk more quickly. And you might have something there. So that's it. Thank you very much. So I know we went over, so I might not have too time for Q&A, but I'm, maybe, you know, I'm here. So if you have any Q&A for anything, some people ask questions about like singularity, and some people ask questions about fear and nostalgia. For instance, where someone's like, oh, I missed the book, and I do agree that we missed the book. And someone says, and I think the important thing in that sentence is, I missed the book. You missed the book. Your kids don't miss the book. It's not nostalgia for them. It's just a stone that was chiseled for them. And that's not entirely a bad thing. What's really interesting about what happens in that singular moment is all these things we're afraid we're getting to could actually be the thing that solves it. Imagine if nostalgia didn't exist anymore, because your mind, whether you're alive or dead, or live forever for that matter, is there. And everyone has access to that nostalgia. Your nostalgia is their nostalgia. So I would reframe that even and say, instead of me losing something, when we get to that point of singularity that we're all driving towards, we actually gain nostalgia back. Because that's all there. Documenting. It's, 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 it's there. Um, so that came up last time. I thought that was a really interesting question. Yeah. I was just thinking that through the whole presentation, that you know the ability to index is, and I think you kind of allude uh, to that thought throughout the whole thing. You know, it's being able to take everything and index it so we all have access right. to it. I think that's exactly what a lot of people say. It's about filtering, and filtering is yet another car to get to point B. Really, it's just that's the only thing you can think of. But when you filter, you, does anyone know what search filtering is? Or search bubble. You want to go get a good no, no, sorry, go ahead, yeah. no, no, it's good. It's good. Oh, search filter? Yeah, the search oh. bubble. The search bubble. I don't know. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. It's uh, <clears throat> when we search, we filter, we kind of limit to what we can, what we experience. We limit our own experience, and we don't get beyond that bubble. So okay. you're, you're close, and closing yourself within the bubble. So what happens with indexing is it's about giving access to people that want to choose it. But filtering is kind of getting around that and saying, we can't get it all. So let's start cutting things out you may not like. Facebook does it all the time. Google does it. If you actually access Google on your computer and other yeah. computer, yeah. it'll have different results. The auto, a, the auto complete stuff. That's right. There's a stuff. Yeah. There's a thing called duck, duck belly. Shoot, I forgot. But I don't know if you use it. I guess that's a good point. Oh, yeah. But was that? Duck, 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 duck. Yeah, duck, 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 where it doesn't do search bubbling or the bubble it doesn't create the bubble, and uh, people have been saying like, don't don't let that happen. What ends up happening there when you do the filter is that you lose information. So I end up becoming more Republican or more Democrat. It just drives people apart. And sometimes people say that that's the reason why we're driving apart. So that was a means to an end because that's the only thing we do. But I think what you nailed is, is it's, that's, that's a product that will work now. 
But some innovator is going to come up and say, it should be about indexing. It should be about getting to the information, not filtering it. How else can we do it? Let's tear it down. This thing called ratcheting up and, and hatcheting down is we'll keep iterating and, and getting to a point that gets us to survive a moment and tear it down now that we understand it and build it down. You seem to have an amazing vision for a small dynamic thought. Thanks. Thanks. Um, are you engaging in the strategy of the company? Yeah, so since this is the direction of share it and share, share, share this, and how does that look? So yeah, so, you for, so, since, so since being there, we're trying to figure out what we can do. We have some projects that we're working on in the background. They may work, they may not. But the idea that is really more about I'm not creating a product that does this, as much as this is where I always frame my thoughts. It's not so much the second principle of he asked for this, but what does that person want? They want to connect. Those APIs for trending is really about exposing data, not trending, right? So how do I get some information faster? One thing that we're working on that's a barrier is that you always need to use code to implement something. So what um, I'm working on with on my group is rethinking that and saying, let's do a no-code solution. What can, yes, maybe difficult, maybe be possible, but what can we build that gives people no code so that when they try to implement it, it's done by a CMO and not by an engineer? So it's just trying to get to those things, and that's one of the projects that came out of that. For a story, it kind of sounds like good content is efficiency. My personal view after doing this thought experiment and writing it, was just, it I think I came to the conclusion, it could be right or wrong, but was that it's about, did it get in your head quickly? Like, that content isn't about you think it's good or bad, although it could be good or bad, although it could be about whether it's good or bad. Yeah, you can always have that thought. But as a product person, as a developer, as an engineer, as a business person, what we're really seeing in that matrix view of things is did that thing to that person quickly? Did they think what they wanted to think? And did they communicate? If so, they're on to something. I'm on to something. He's on to something. And that's, I think, the idea. So I mean, talking about the singularity, too, once we get to that point and you have 100% access to anything that you want in milliseconds by downloading or whatever, wouldn't you think? Or your opinion on like it's a philosophical question, right? The social implications of something like that, or security issues behind something like that. It's like there's no way to manage it. Yeah, I think you know? the Bill Gates so. had a good quote on his Kurzel's book on singularity, yeah. which was that it's going to take us to a point that's so unimaginable. It's a moving target with a moving target. I think a lot of a lot of times when I use the cliche like when iPhone comes out or all these different or Yo comes out or anything like that, people always say, "Oh, that's the thing that we're talking about." And then they start talking about it from a static point of view. But both things are moving, you know, yeah. all the time. So by the time we get there, the thing that we're looking through the lens of, the lens we're using, will be so different too. So I usually just say, it's probably going to happen. That I know. I know. What do I know? I know it's going to happen. I know it's going to be all access. If it wasn't a problem, because there'll be people in that environment with that lens solving that problem, what do I need to do? How do I, how do I use a working product? Actually, I share this a lot of times with my group. I say, like, when there's a question like, is this going to work or not, step back. Our group isn't worried about whether the data will be good. That's the data group. Our group is worried about if it's good, how do we make it great? Um, if I try to solve both, then, then it doesn't work out, right? I think that applies to life. Like, it will work. There will be that situation. We're, we're not at a point now where we could understand it. Right, but what we do understand is that it would be all content. Yeah. So what would you do? I don't know. That's, that's, that's the way to think of it, yeah, though. Like, I mean, what would I do? I would, I would definitely want to be in the business of making sure that I have the quickest access to that data, right? Yeah. I mean, you can, like, that's what I would do. Is, like, I would, I would want to be in the position where people can um, not have to pay as much, right? So commoditizing the access to And you can see Amazon's doing that. Yeah. So, like, as you think of this, sometimes you actually think of something and be like, oh, that's, that's what he's doing. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, bring up philosophical much of what needs to be happening along with this conversation is should be social as well because you know it's one thing to have access to information, but you know, we as humans really need to start looking at social implications on a much different level. And in fact, it's got to start growing at the same speed the technology is happening because you know not to, you know, position myself anywhere, but we all need to get to that same place as opposed to a chosen few. And I think that access, like you were talking about, getting uh, that thought 
on a concept or whatever to anybody with, you know, with, is, is just as important as being able to do it. So I'm hoping we're all kind of thinking socially too. And of course, that's another great thing I think about in San Francisco is, you know, that we're really open to a lot of and concepts and pretty much let everything go and see where it lands, you know. So. Yeah. I mean, that is what Pinterest is. That is what WhatsApp is. That is what Facebook yeah. is. That is what, that is what Uber is. I mean, it doesn't have to be a software. I mean, I'm getting from point A to point B is an inefficiency of the fact that my mind's like there. Example. People ask. People ask this specifically, and this is again like, why? Why am I saying this? Because we've solved it. We're past that. I don't think we are at all. Oculus is bought by Facebook, and everyone's like, why? And it's not about how good the technology is, although for the people who buy it, that's a big part of it. How good is it? But for like understanding it, it's about the fact that I'm here, you're there. Can I make a product that solves it? My mind's here, your mind's there. I'm locked. That's what that is. It's the ability for us to not have those barriers. But I would, you know, I would say just like I said earlier in the talk. Every product really is getting at that fundamental thing. Oculus is getting my mind that pictures this game that lets you have this vicarious life of shooting someone, not good or bad, um, in, on, your, on your person such that it's just like, it's just injected into your brain. Um, that scares people. The word injection and instant makes people feel uneasy. But it is, like I said, no different than the chisel. It's just half the time. So uh, if you want to get these slides or other slides and stuff, I'll post to the, my Twitter account on the thread, at S. Shadman. Uh, again, I'll just keep posting as I transfer this stuff to, um, what do you call it, to, uh, to the cloud, um, <laughs> as I you know, make these videos available. So um, if anyone that wants to see it or share it or look at it again and critique it and say, you know, there was a slide in there I didn't agree with, and I don't remember what it was, let me make sure. Feel free to critique it, but give it back to me. Um, again, it's the mind meld in my mind. So, what did I do that you think differently? And, and, and think from there. And there's still drinks, there's still food. So there's no. So also, uh, if you answered a question, you know, take some. Feel free. If you didn't, probably not. Nice you to take it before they do, but I'm not going to stop you either. So, but you can after there. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Thanks for the question. Thank you very much. We had a great first question. <laughs> Is where we talk about what we're doing, and I think at the bottom it says apply. So like, okay. it's all the things you need to know right there. Okay, cool. Yeah. It's not some position posted where they need more topics, but not anything to sell. Yeah, either either way, ping um, HR at okay. probably, okay. and then see. Okay. Yeah, we always.
keep it capable, no, so it's never a, it's never a wall. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. I just want to thank the talk. It's the best talk I've heard so far. I never really had that kind of stuff. And you were really great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Appreciate it. Any of these ways, but just started following you on Twitter. Okay, yeah, you can you can ping me through there. If, and that's probably probably the easiest to remember. Okay. Um two years of action. Also you go short time? Yeah. Okay, because the, what you're talking about is yeah. this the same print. It was really interesting to hear it applied because basically the author yes. creates this character that's really interested in blocks and the whole point is that we're all moving towards a greater good. Yeah. So it's in the conversation of good and evil. Anything that yeah. promotes yeah. humankind moving towards um, I think I'm to explore, like okay. promoting forward and yeah. sort of good yeah. and everything they can versus it is bad. Yeah. So it's the same thing yeah. Yeah. that yeah. seeds up the time. The yeah. hate is then good. Yeah, it's, uh, it was, I was the like, I don't need to bread. No, I haven't. The reason why I put peace in there is because I don't think it's not on the same page. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like peace yeah, yeah, yeah. and crap. They get into that. Yeah. 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 It's Shantaran's yeah. like this. It's one of the best books I've ever read. It's like such a great book. Super random. What's your last name? Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. I'll be in touch with you. Thanks so much. Thanks for coming and helping out. Have all this equipment. Yeah. Thank you. That's why I'm warning you when you're talking about it. Okay, that's why I'm saying that. Okay, so you want to say why? Actually, I do. Oh, that's a good It's a viral. That's actually not what I'm saying. It is. And it's super interesting. So you're just saying that. I think so. This went, this is the Twitter. If you want to get my email, it's this Julian Shadow.